Welcome to uh, yet another edition of Whiskeying, the Canadian whiskey show for people who don't normally watch whiskey shows. My name's Richard. I'll be your guide this week to Pike Creek, 21-year-old. Hey, that's on the old side for Canadian whiskey. Finished in European oak cast. There's a little bit more to the story than this. Uh, they will getting too nerdy and dirty. I'll get into that little bit of that. Uh, but of course, gonna taste it up and... Uh, talk a little bit more about not only this whiskey but uh, a little bit about blending um, because this is a blend and uh, not only of uh, not only from different barrels three different kinds of barrels actually but um, also a, typically uh, you expect rye barley in a Canadian whiskey this is corn whiskey so uh, some different things going on here and I want to talk about uh, some of how that uh, that mixed up style is a little bit Canadian and what it kind of means. Uh, because, of course, this is whiskey education as well as just watching some guy drinking whiskey. Uh, but as always, I like to start with the palate, talk a little bit about the bottle. So Pike Creek 21, like I said, uh, 21 years old, as, as you might expect. 45% uh, uh, ABV, well, <laughs> uh, alcohol by volume for those... Uh, for those out there. Um, now this is bottle 1381 of 4,020. Ooh, very important. One of merely 4,000 people in this world who's had a sip of this. Well, how exclusive. Um, I mean, that's fine. What it likely means is there's a, this was just a limited release and uh, that's fine. Uh, we'll see if it's worth the, uh, that kind of hype. Um, in terms of well, so what went into the bottle? Like I said, corn whiskey. Um, it was aged in some ex-bourbon barrels. Uh, thank you to distiller.com. They did a little breakdown. The The website for the uh, distillery actually didn't have a lot of information about the bottle. So um, going off distiller.com's uh, work on this. So 50% uh, ex-bourbon with corn uh, whiskey to begin with. So you could think of this as a bit of a bourbon almost because that's probably sacrilege in some parts of the states. Uh, don't come get me, Kentucky. But um, so corn whiskey, ex-bourbon barrels, got some bourbon vibes going on, but then they mix it up with European oak, so French oak and Hungarian oak. I didn't know Hungary had oaks. Maybe not anymore after this release. Who knows? But um, yeah, so it does add a little bit of uh, different kinds of flair. Uh, I, as far as I can tell, that is new fill French, and, and meaning that it uh, didn't have another alcohol in it previously, but again, it's kind of scant details on this one, which uh, is kind of interesting for uh, modern whiskey. They always seem to want to tell the romance story with this, and uh, Pike Creek does have a, a kind of cool backstory, but um, yeah, interesting that they didn't have a lot more on it. Whatever. It's all about what it tastes like, right? So, on the nose. Even when you, you just bring it up, I've got a little bit of a raisins vibe to it. A little bit of a juiciness there. It's got, um, you can, it's got that sugar smell, like it's a little bit sickly sweet with um, uh, like a pinch of almost vinegar to it. Like you, you pick up a, um, almost a, like a, a barbecue sauce mop kind of vibe to it. Now, I'm not used to tasting a lot of uh, pure corn whiskey, so uh, I'm not a huge bourbon person. Not Nothing against bourbon. Again, it looks, seems like I got something against the southern states today. I don't. I'm sure they're largely, uh, well, as, as Mr. Trump would say, they're great people. They're great people down there. That's the worst impression. Why did I even try that? Um, so... Uh, Anyways, uh, it I'm not a I, I don't get into bourbon a lot. I like to focus on Canadian whiskey, so maybe I'm just picking up some corn vibes, and I'm not calling it straight. Yeah. Oh, there's something I'm na nailing here. It's one of those weird like food, not food. <laughs> like like it smells like. Um... <clears throat> well. I would say it smells a little bit uh, of like that paint thinner kind of smell. No, it's not. It, it's nicer than that. 
I, I would say there's a little bit of like a rosemary um, uh, herb kind of vibe to it, uh, like some some rich green herb. But um, mainly, yeah, that it's that sweetness with a, maybe a kick of tartness that, that's coming off the nose. Um, I'll keep you in suspense on what it tastes like. Um, so, blending. Um, was talking about this uh, uh, just the other night with some friends. Uh, there's again, if you're new to whiskey, you know, if this is if you if you know whiskey well, frankly, this show is probably not for you because I don't get that deep into it. Uh, instead, I just love talking about what kind of sticks out to me is kind of neat uh, and important. So. Um, you may be going to a whiskey store. Maybe you're getting into this for the first time. I'm inspiring you to try out some whiskey. I'd be so happy to be in your enabler. Um, you're going to go to the whiskey store and you're going to see a wall of options. And there's going to be blends. And, you know, they've got a bit of a reputation being kind of the lower shelf. You might not catch them in your line of sight right away. But there's going to be a whole wall of single malts. Scotch whiskey usually single malt, ah, a mark of quality, uh, a mark of charging you more, mark up. Um, <laughs> and there's, uh, then there's, of course, there's like very limited releases that we'll talk about coming from a single barrel. So what's the deal with this? What's the difference? Is there one actually better than the other? Not necessarily. And I think, you know, to give you a preview of what it actually tastes like, you know, this being a blend of different whiskeys from different barrels and all that it's not a, a mark against it um friend another friend was asking me the other day like is there a blend you particularly enjoy usually johnny walker black label not that fancy but they managed to pull together some nice soft whiskey from some places with a little bit just a hint of smoke i'm not a big smoky whiskey guy but you add a little bit of that together that blending lets you really customize the taste and that's kind of cool um, there, uh, you know, compass box, there's been some other release in the last number of years that have really focused on doing good blends. Yes, there are some cheap shitty blends out there, uh, whatever, um, you know, still don't go for the bottom of the shelf, no matter what. I think that's kind of the rule of thumb here. Um, single malt. What does that mean? It means it's coming whiskey from a single distillery, which also usually means it's a single grain. Uh, you could have one without the other single grain that comes from multiple distillers, whatever. But generally, single malt means it's coming from a single distillery. So it's their own barrels. Um, and generally, they will work with one kind of mash. And they, they do barley in Scotland. They'll do rye at, uh, all, you know, down at Alberta Premium here. Um, I forget the name of that distillery offhand. Um, you know, there's lots of 100% rye on the market now in Canada. Those would be single grain. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that they're not blended, to be clear. It just means that the blends are coming from the same kind of source. Uh, but a master distiller is still going to take samples from different balls, and they're trying to create a consistent product, a deeply colored product, because if you see a thin whiskey, chances are you're going to think, oh, it's not that aged. That's not necessarily true. Uh, there's a whole bunch of factors that they want to they want to kind of even out the flavor, the color, all that stuff, so they will blend from different places add more old whiskey if they want to be more expensive, etc. right? Um, then there are truly those like single barrel. They took that cask of whiskey, they put whatever 200 some bottles uh, out of it, and took 200 some bottles out of it, and there you go. Um, now those ones are pretty unique and fun in that they can be great or terrible uh, depending on, well not terrible, they probably won't sell something terrible, but Older isn't necessarily better in that range, whereas like a single malt or a blend is going to kind of even out the, the crappy whiskey with some of the good stuff to mix it together and have something pretty respectable. Um, now, of course, it runs the gamut of price, though. So like a single barrel, more limited release, maybe something that a bottling company that just buys casks and brings them in and bottles them will do. Those are going to be more expensive, so you kind of know what you're looking for there. And you can find some really interesting limited stuff that way. But the difference between single malts and blends, they're all, they're all blends. It's just it, they're diff, blended from different things. So it's 
not often necessarily worth the extra price to get a single malt for when you can actually get some really more interesting stuff from a blend. So no need to be pretentious about it, no need to pay extra dollars just to have that title on it. It means something, but it doesn't mean everything. Uh, so for instance, this Pipe Creek one being blended, you know, having that ex-bourbon, having that French, that Hungarian oak, and, you know, and I believe Pike Creek uh, does not do their, uh, I'm, well, I, I'll take this back. I'm not sure they do their own distilling, uh, maybe for an addition like this, because 21 is very old for Canadian whiskey generally. Um, so chances are, again, lack of information, I guess that they are pulling in whiskey from other distilleries and then aging it at their warehouse. And that's what they talk about on their website. Their big claim to fame is that they don't heat their warehouse. So in the winter, the barrels like contract and I don't know, well, they don't freeze because they're full of alcohol. Uh, but, you know, the wood squeezes and expands over the summer and winter and all that sort of thing. Uh, I have no clue. That could be absolute whiskey romance. Or it could be uh, a really neat chemical process. I don't, uh, or mechanical process of the wood expanding and contracting. I don't know. Just kind of the kind of the story behind there, I thought was kind of interesting. So, getting back to this bad boy. Mm. Yeah, the first time I tasted this, I actually didn't realize um, I didn't I hadn't read that it was corn whiskey, and you could always pick up the sweetness of it. But I kind of I kind of pick up that vibe now, a little bit of that bourbon vibe. Yeah, so it's got a little bit of that, like, um, a musty sort of flavor. Uh, like, bourbon has a little bit of musty, grassy quality to it with a bunch of sweet. So I can tell that's in here. Um, the... Hmm. Hmm. It, I, it, I can maybe see the European oak uh, in it. Hmm. It's a, it's got a little bit of the um, sort of grapey, whiny quality that you'd almost see out of like a sherry. Now these aren't sherry barrels per se. But it's definitely a strong like wood vanilla flavor um, that might be coming from the European barrels, but then again, you know, it's also um, it's also American oak that the the bourbon went into that uh, that this whiskey then went into afterwards. So it's got a strong oak vanilla character to it, um, with you know perhaps a little bit more complexity than a than a, a some bourbons might have. Um, And it does have a, um, a fairly thick mouthfeel. When I'm looking at the glass here, you know, it's kind of got like, I, I don't know, I'll call it a medium body. It's got some legs to it. Uh, you know, it's dripping down the glass, leaving some streaks. Not a little bit of uh, splash water at the top of it. It looks like water in a glass. Uh, like when you when you roll it around, it looks like it's got splashes around. It's kind of weak, uh, uh, you know, thin bodied, not terribly oily. On the other side, you get some ones that coat it like paint. Uh, and that's uh, that's a kind of really oily side one. So this one's somewhat in the middle of that, uh, but a nice nice mouthfeel out of that. Mm. Mm. There is a nice note, a little bit of cigar in this one, and then that actually amplifies toward the back of it. So when uh, on the on the finish here, uh, you know, as it rolls off the back of my tongue, I'm getting a, yeah a little bit of that like post cigar kind of spicy burny kind of sensation in my mouth not at all unpleasant actually quite nice i could see this pairing very well one of my favorite things to do this in summer and this saturday friends of mine don't know it um we're doing a uh we're doing a social distance uh, uh bonfire here Boy, if someone watches this in like 10 years, they're going to be like, oh, right, that pandemic thing that happened a long time ago. That's a big deal now. Um, either way, I'm going to get everyone a cigar, and it's going to be wonderful to sit around a bonfire again, 
with a whiskey and a cigar, and it's going to be this one, I think, this, this time around. So nice accompaniment there. Hmm. I just picked up a real caramel nose. I don't know if this thing is, is the alcohol starting to burn off. Uh, just like woof caramel right off the right off the top there. Mm. Yeah, I'm picking up more antique wood now on those. Like this one's actually opening up as I'm kind of letting the alcohol burn off. I didn't add any water to it. That's something you can do that would maybe speed that process up of it like opening up. I um, uh, the flavors changing as you add a little bit of water to it. Uh, it's a real thing that happens. Uh, there's actually a chemical process behind it with how the fat, fatty acids in this move around or whatever. I don't know. Like I said, that save that for the uh, whiskey reviewers that are really into this. Um, either way, enjoyment factors going up here as I, as I drink it. Um, really, at, and at the end of the day, I don't give the a whiskey rating other than to buy, not buy. Um, I think price-wise, this is coming in around a hundred bucks uh, Canadian bottle. If you can get a hold of it, I know it's L LCBO. Definitely available at. Uh, I think I bought this one from Kagan Cork here in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, either way, if you can get a hold of this one, about a hundred bucks a bottle. Um, you know, it's not going to disappoint for a higher-end whiskey. Uh, you know, especially on the Canadian side, when you get up around. 100 bucks over like you you've got kind of the pick of the litter for uh, a lot of different kind of the gamut of all the good whiskey canadian whiskey so um you know when you compare it up there i don't think it's a clear standout winner um i mean just the fact of being corn which is not typically canadian although i love the fact that canadian whiskey is known for doing kind of whatever um for blending rye and wheat and uh, barley and some corn and all that sort of thing. I kind of like that. Uh, but this being uh, focused on corn, I don't know, maybe you're going to compare it to a bourbon and maybe you're going to want to go, you know, instead of buying some Canadian bourbon-esque thing, go and get some bourbon. Wouldn't hold against you. Um, this wouldn't be the my absolute first pick. It's not like that standout, like, I got to drop a hundred bucks on there. So it's like some great value. It's a, it's a very, um, it's got enough layers to it to be an, an entertaining whiskey. And I've always said that this really whiskey is about entertainment value, sitting back and just nosing through it and finding some stuff just because what else is there to do when you're, uh, when you're trapped at your house, uh, until the virus goes away. Eh. So uh, this is something you can definitely sip on for half an hour, 20 minutes, and just find some different things in it. So I like that. It's got that value to it. I don't feel terrible about spending 100 bucks on it. Um, but I wouldn't say uh, lock this down as your favorite one either. Keep exploring.